So, welcome to the Blue Deal debate. And in these discussions, we look at fisheries issues, we look at the seas, we look at the marine environment. I'm Chris Davis, and this webinar is taking place thanks to the support of the Wood Pedersen Consultancy in Brussels. Now, people on the planet are now eating more fish that is farmed than is caught in the sea. There's been an absolute explosion in the growth of aquaculture in China and, and, the, and the rest of Asia. By comparison, Europe's been left behind. I mean, obviously, we get salmon in quite large quantities from Norway and, and Europe but within, and Scotland. But within the European Union, we're producing perhaps just 1%, just over 1% of the world's total farmed fish. But if Europe's missing out, is that a bad thing? Environmentalists don't have a lot of good things to say about aquaculture. So today I've got the chance to discuss these issues with three people who know what they're talking about. From Brussels, Lorella de la Cruz Iglesias from the European Commission, the head of the aquaculture unit there. From London, Chris Ninnis of the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. And from Madrid, Javier Javier Ojeda, who is the uh, Secretary General, General Secretary of the uh, Federation of European Aquaculture Producers. Now, I like the Blue Deal debates to be informative, but I also like them to be lively. Don't want anyone have to have to go to sleep because they're watching this webinar. And if you're following it, and uh, my wife says she doesn't look at the pictures, she only listens to the, to the conversation, and you want to express your views, then on the right hand side, there's a comment box uh, where you can submit questions and, and answers. Uh, <laughs> no, we'll provide the answers. You submit the questions and perhaps the comments. And at the end of the program, uh, our guests have said they'll stay on for some time to, to look at those comments and discuss the questions with those who, uh, who want to participate. Right, let's get started. This huge expansion of aquaculture in China. 88% apparently of farmed fish is now coming from, from Asia. The EU, this tiny, tiny percentage by comparison. Javier, I mean, you represent the producers. I, I, how does it feel? I mean, does it feel we're being left behind or does it still feel that aquaculture is growing? Yes, we feel that we are going back. Since the turn of the century, aquaculture production in the European Union, and by aquaculture I mean both fin fish and, and shellfish has stagnated and it has stagnated in a moment in which in the rest of the world it has continued growing so so we feel bad about that uh, does it actually feel i mean by comparison to the growth figures of asia then clearly we are stagnating but but are we are we actually not increasing agriculture production in europe at all well, it depends. Some species are growing and uh, some are going down and not all countries are in the same situation. When we talk out about the European Union, yes, but when we look at Norway or even Scotland, the situation is is uh, different. But going back to how the situation is in, in, in Europe, the, the, the main issue is that we, because we, we are not able to grow, we are importing into the European Union increasing amounts and amounts, growing amounts of, of seafood, of aquatic crows from the sea, from, from fresh water. And that is something that the European, that the European Union should, should uh, try to, to find a solution to, because it's not uh, how things should be. And uh, uh, now with the COVID-19 crisis, we have even seen uh, uh, increasing the value of, of of food security of being able to produce okay. food in the European Union. Okay, so you would you would argue that not only for good commercial reasons, but we should be producing. We could be producing more food that currently we're we're importing. Yeah, of course. Uh, the European Union, if we consider it as a country, it has a second longest coastline in the world, just behind Canada. We've got lots of rivers. We have a huge capacity to increase aquaculture production. We have researchers that have the knowledge. We have workers that know how to do the job. We have training institutions. We have entrepreneurs willing to invest in aquaculture. And it just happens that there are certain hurdles or barriers that we are unable to cross. And okay. I guess we'll discuss about this. Yes, we will. Lorella, um, 
It wasn't supposed to be like this. When we passed the 2013 reform of the common fisheries policy, quite a lot of the emphasis was given to the fact that you know, we were trailing behind aquaculture and there was great potential, but that potential doesn't seem to be realized. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, uh, I would agree that uh, the potential hasn't realized. I mean, I think there's still a lot of potential for the EU aquaculture to grow and diversify, by the way, not only grow, but uh, diversify in terms of the species and member states are producing. Um, we had, in fact, adopted a framework for uh, aquaculture policy uh, at EU European Union level in 2013 because the sector was stagnating. So that was the reason why we did that. And uh, we have seen uh, since uh, in the recent years uh, some recovery of the sector and some timid uh, growth. So there has been growth, but still very timid, and we, we acknowledge that. Uh, there has been efforts since 2013 uh, to give some vision, you know, to the sector and to, to member states uh, in supporting the sector in order to make it more sustainable, but also more competitive. And as I said, some progress has been made, but it's still not enough. So we acknowledge that. And there are different reasons for that. Uh, I think one reason is, is political attention, to be frank. Yeah. Not, I'm not talking about the Commission, yeah. I'm talking about member states. Uh, I think uh, aquaculture is a, is a sector that is quite marginal in most member states. Uh, so it's not like the sector that attracts more attention, political attention. So I think that's one factor. But there are other factors there, like, you know, aquaculture is a, is a highly regulated sector and it has to be a highly regulated sector, in my opinion, uh, as other sectors that are, uh, you know, in the farming uh, activity. But at the same time, it's complex and uh, it leads to uh, uh, complexity in terms of administrative procedures. There's also the question that, you know, for aquaculture, you need to use uh, public space. So you need access to space, to public yeah, space. Yeah. So, can, I just, uh, can I just say, that, I mean, you're, you're dialing in from, from Belgium. Yeah. Um, I think Belgium is the lowest aquaculture in the whole of the European Union, doesn't it? I think it's got one trout farm or, or something in the whole of the country. Well, you still have Luxembourg. <laughs> <laughs> Luxembourg may not even appear on the list. But tell me, I mean, the European Commission has very limited powers here, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's joint responsibility, but really it's up to member states to, to take the lead. Indeed, I mean, uh, aquaculture uh, in the EU is regulated by also EU legislation, but general legislation that, you know, relates to environmental protection, to uh, health issues, consumer protection. This applies equally to aquaculture as to other sectors. But indeed, what is policy in terms of developing the sector, this is member state competence. And sometimes I would say that even in some member states, it's regional competence. Because, for example, to have a license to, to, to establish a, a farm, sometimes it's the regional authorities that do this. So this is what adds to the complexity of the development of the sector. OK, we'll come back, we'll come back to that. But the, um, uh, Chris, Chris Ninnis in, in, in London at the Agriculture Stewardship Council. I know ASC, which I think, let, let me just give it positive history, but it was, had a big influence from WWF in its, in its foundation, building on the work at the Marine Stewardship Council, I suppose. And um, you think you can claim to be the, the leading, if not the only proper aquaculture certification body, but you wouldn't have been created if there wasn't concerns about aquaculture from consumers or retailers or, or whatever. Hi, Chris, uh, we need your microphone. Oh, it's always easier to That's talk it. to people with a microphone on, sorry. Um, so I, I think you're right. I, I think with the growth of uh, attention on the on the environmental impacts of wild capture fisheries, uh, that spurred the development of the Marine Stewardship Council. And in a way, the growth of aquaculture over the last 20 years has only highlighted the importance of aquaculture in that supply chain, in the, in the seafood supply chain. And that gave the impetus to direct and develop the Aquaculture Stewardship Council to look at to look into both uh, what the environmental impacts and the social impacts of aquaculture is globally. And that's basically what we're here to do is to try and make a positive contribution by linking the production with the market uh, to bring about those changes when farms meet the standards. So what, what drives certification? Why do, why do people, obviously it involves expense. You've got, to, you've got to jump through a lot of hoops. And I think Javier would say, uh, aquaculture producers already have to jump through a lot of hoops. What, what, what drives the, the desire for these standards? I think essentially it's, it's the market. I think the market is uh, demanding 
uh, uh, verification that uh, uh, that the food that's produced and consumed meets certain standards and uh, the ASC provides uh, uh, that opportunity. Uh, it, it does come with costs and, and I sympathize with the producers because they, as you said, they've already had to jump some high hurdles to become established uh, uh, within within the EU. Um, but, but again, I think that, you know, aquaculture uh, can be done better. I mean, almost any production system can be improved on and, and I think by meeting the standards that are set out uh, through the ASC's uh, processes, um, that allows uh, those producers to, to be able to demonstrate that and to and to, to make those sorts of those claims. Okay, we'll come back. But you touched on the market, Javier. There, I mean, how much demand is there for farmed fish? I mean, if there was a huge demand, and clearly there would seem to be in in Asia then many of the obstacles that Lorella has just mentioned would be swept aside because the financial incentives to, to go ahead would be just so great. Okay, when, uh, when a European citizen goes to buy, goes to the market, wants to buy fish, in general, they don't go looking for farmed fish or captured fish. They just go for fish or for a species they are uh, knowledgeable with. Um, so the, 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 the issue here is not so much expanding the market, but making room for European produced farmed fish. Because today we are going to, we are, we are talking about the environmental impact of aquaculture. And uh, as, you, as you mentioned before, uh, the, the great majority of farmed fish that is produced in the world happens in Asia, 92%, mostly China. Of course, China is huge. It's the biggest also fishing nation, but most comes from, from, from Asia. So what we can control and try to improve here is the way in which aquaculture is done in the European Union. And we would like to, uh, to increase the share of farmed in the European, in Europe, in the European Union and in Europe, share of the European market for fish. Because as I said before, over 9 million tons of fish are imported into the European Union every single year, while we only produce in aquaculture 1.1 or 2.7 if we include the, the European economic area. But so that's where we would like to grow. Financially, how can you compete with the imported fish? I mean, I, I take it a lot of that imported fish, some of it from farms, but a lot of it's uh, caught within the sea, is, is simply coming in at a price which consumers can better afford. Yeah, uh, we should always have a good understanding of what price means and how it's built. Um, in many occasions, uh, seafood coming from third countries, distant countries in, in, in Asia, in most occasions, uh, do not bring with their price the real cost of production. There are many externalities, negative externalities, in general having to do with the environment, but also with so, uh, social issues, employment and, and others that stay over there. I mean, taking care of the environment costs money. Um, and it's good that that cost goes with the price and consumers that are knowing what they buy are willing to pay that price. But when the fish arrives with that external externality not included in the price of course the price is cheaper but if you add all the different costs of the product there wouldn't be that much difference okay but as you say we need to protect the environment at the same time as we're producing quality fish um i mean some of the i think you've, you're on record as having said you have to be a hero to go into agricultural aquaculture production in europe oh, and i take it that's because, it, because because there seems to be just so many environmental barriers but Lorella, I mean, you know, things like the Water Framework Directive, which insists that we should have um, good chemical status, good biological status of, of, of water. I mean, the concern, presumably, is that, um, is that aquaculture leads to deterioration in water quality that's unacceptable. How do we balance these things? Well, in fact, I think, uh, as has been mentioned uh, before, I mean, there's no human activity that doesn't have an impact on the environment, on the, you know, on the, on the surroundings. Uh, it all, all has an impact. And we can also talk about agriculture, for example, or livestock farming. 
So the question is, there will be an impact. The question is whether the impact is acceptable and whether this uh, impact makes uh, uh, is, uh, is a threat to the ecosystem. I mean, uh, so uh, it's precisely the EU legislation what is, is trying to, to achieve is that any activity, I'm not only talking about aquaculture because there are other activities in the marine environment, of course, that any activity that happens in, in the marine environment uh, limits its impact and uh, to, to it and in a way that ecosystems are preserved. So uh, aquaculture, as I said, is one of the activities. Uh, I think aquaculture in the EU has made a lot of progress in this respect. Uh, I think, uh, as uh, Javier has mentioned, the, the standards uh, in the EU, due to EU legislation, but not only, I think there has been an effort also by, by the industry itself, is they are quite high compared to other countries. So uh, I think, uh, despite of this, there's a role of communication. I think there, there needs to be a way to communicate better this to the consumer and to the citizens, because there are concerns out there, indeed, there are concerns about the environmental impact of aquaculture, but we have also to inform the consumers that to, to establish a, a, a farm in the EU, there are many, many requirements. Uh, there are also environmental monitoring of the farms, so uh, it's not something that you do, you just put fish on the water and then you wait to see what happens. So um, I think that's something that we would we could do better. We, meaning Commission could play a role, but Member States especially and industry as well. Well, Chris Ninnis, you probably have a, you know, a global view here. Here we have China and we have uh, Asia with this enormous expansion in uh, aquaculture. What's their quality like? I mean, presumably they're not meeting the same sort of environmental standards that producers in Europe have to meet. I think the... Um... The standards of farming, I mean, vary quite significantly, uh, depending where you are, what species you talk about. Um, but nonetheless, uh, as has been demonstrated, uh, farms in Asia do meet uh, and can meet the ASC standards. So they are performing to a level that takes into account both environment and, uh, and social concerns. But I think the, you know, to come back to the, the, the European story, I, th I think there's a huge opportunity for aquaculture uh, produced in Europe. Uh, I think there's a, a market opportunity. I think COVID has, ex has exposed uh, the lengthy supply chains that many of these other products have in terms of continuity of supply, volatility of price. And I think something that's homegrown, home farmed, uh, has many attributes, the provenance of product farmed and raised and reared with attention to the environment, attention to social uh, concerns brings much to the marketing of European fish. And, and in some ways, it's almost uh, it's in a, an embryonic state for many of the species that are farmed in in uh, in in Europe, because it, it, to supply into a market means you have to be able to provide adequate uh, you, you have to provide year-round product at volumes that can meet meet demand. So, I think it's uh, uh, if if we could kickstart the industry, promote the industry within Europe, then I think there's, there would be a ready market opportunity for that for that product. Just, I think you're getting away too lightly here, Chris. I mean, ASC, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, on its website says you're there to promote responsible aquaculture. But almost by definition, that means you're aware, and wouldn't exist if this were if this were not the case, that there was a lot of irresponsible aquaculture across the globe. I mean, you know, environmentalists keep saying, you know, there's real concerns about aquaculture. I mean, tell us. I mean, you can't, so so if we look at we're looking here at the China and Asia rather than the, the European producers for the moment, but there must be many instances where you know, environmentally this is really bad news. It, uh, completely, and I think you have to look at aquaculture not only at an at a individual farm level but also at a greater broader spatial level so the density of farms in an area can have a big impact uh, i think you need to look into carefully uh, how uh, uh, seafood is actually fed within that environment because the uh, the feed the feed that goes into that also has consequence um, i think you need to look at the management of disease and we've seen some uh, pretty horrific uh, consequences of uh, diseases within the shrimp industry that have wiped, you know, billions off of the value that they could be providing globally. So there are 
there are major concerns. And if you if you look at the proportion of aquaculture that it, that it's certified, not not just by the ASC, but by other organizations as well, then it's still a relatively small percentage that we've achieved globally. Uh, so there's there's much work to be done. But again, I think you have to consider aquaculture in a bigger picture of of all uh, uh, terrestrial production and, and aquatic production, because certainly aquaculture uh, offers many benefits, not only nutritionally, uh, but from an environmental perspective. I think aquaculture actually is part of a climate solution, because when you compare it to other other uh, protein production, then it, it fares better. It, it has lower environmental impact. And uh, I think that's something that we need to recognize as we go forward with this with this discussion, not just here, but but generally it it is part of that climate solution. Yeah, can we all recognize that? That um, uh, fish and in, in, including farmed fish are, are from a climate point of view, very low in, in terms of CO2 production, very healthy, omega-3, fatty acids, low fat, always, always you know, a good a good substitute for beef, for example. Are we all agreed? Absolutely. I like beef as well, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get onto the climate issues at another time. I think, yeah, uh, Harvey, <laughs> please, you're at Lorena. I think it's also a question of, you know, it's not aquaculture is, is, is a good alternative to beef, it's sustainable aquaculture is a good alternative to other less sustainable farming practices. And uh, so, um, but indeed, uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, what has been said about uh, the role of aquaculture in a more sustainable food system. And I think that's going to be part of the debate in, in very soon. Uh, as you know, there was the European Green Deal communication uh, that came out and aquaculture, farm seafood is mentioned there in terms of potential. And, uh, and we hope to see something also mentioned uh, on that uh, in the future farm to fork uh, communication, so strategy. So um, indeed, I think on the one hand, we have to talk about sustainability of the EU aquaculture and also sustainability, the potential of sustainable aquaculture in the global food system. I would agree, yeah. We're going to try and come up, I'm going to try and take us on to yeah. specifics about some of the measures that European governments need to take. But still in, in, um, in, in general terms, Javier, you, you want um, protection for the European industry from imports which take no regard of labor conditions, of, the, of, of your child labor in some of these, in many perhaps um, aquaculture plants in, in, uh, in Asia, um, of, of, of poor standards, they're not, they're not bothered perhaps about environmental pollution. I mean, it realistically, you know, if you, as you look to Lorello and the European Commission, they can't, how do they provide such sort of protection for you? Yeah. Okay, so it's not so much about protection, but about having a level playing field. And let me a quick step back to put in perspective what we are talking about. Here the issue is our world, our planet Earth, we are heading to Earth towards 9 billion people in, in very little time. More food will be needed to be produced. And that's where the different feed production sectors have to find solutions to be responsible and to be sustainable. And that's where we are. It's true that the European Union population is not growing, but we are used to import a lot of food. So, yeah, uh, solutions for that many. In any case, I would like to just make a little comment on the heroicity that you mentioned before, because today, just to put it also a little bit in the context. <laughs> the, where we are. the heroicity, did you say? Heroicity, yeah, to be yeah, heroes. I love, I love, okay. You're going to be a hero to work in the agriculture industry. I love that. I have, yeah. no, heroicity but the thing is a new is, one on me. Okay, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, what I want to say is that today I am here discussing about aquaculture as an environmental disaster, perhaps. But tomorrow I will be in a meeting in, on aquaculture about uh, an, an aquaculture as an animal welfare disaster. Or next week I will be in one about uh, aquaculture as a food safety disaster. Or further, I will have to another one further down the road about aquaculture fish as second best choice. Or another one about the disaster that aquaculture can be with regard to food safety. What I mean is that we have to, as a, a federation, as a sector, we have to have a very holistic approach to life, to everything. Environment, obviously, is one of the most th important things that we have to, to be respectful for. But as producers, we have to look at many, many different uh, aspects of how we do things. So all together, you become a hero if you want to survive. Yes, that's correct. 
but we will make it. And you were asking me for specific measures. Yes, no, not protection, just a level playing field. We can go into the details of, of, uh, of what would we ask our governments or the commission to improve the playing ground of aquaculture. But that's it. Not so much prote protection, but be able to compete with the same rules. Mm. But the, the difficulty from an environmental point of view is uh, insisting that other countries impose environmental le re le regulation as equivalent to that of the European Union. Not yeah, that but, easy. Impossible, yeah, but not only... No, not impossible. I beg your pardon, no, no, not no. impossible. Not impossible because we, we do it for things like chemicals and... and, and yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, and but it's not only that. I mean, um, we want consumers to buy responsibly, to have the possibility to do responsible choices when they buy. So one of the issues that has to be solved in the European Union is consumer information about fish. Okay, the European Commission published this this week. It does every year uh, a report on food fraud. And fish and fish products are always up there at the top, just second, just second to fats and oil and, and oils, mainly olive oil. So just after olive oil, it's fish in which consumers are misled on what they buy. And that is where, for example, ASC plays a good role because consumers are able to, to know more about what they are buying. So it's, it's not only a matter of protection, but it's also improving consumers' possibilities to buy what they want to buy. And that's something in which the Commission has a role, yeah. member states have a role. So there are different things playing, there are different yeah. roles. On the, on the information side, and of course the retailers have a big role too, and, and uh, you could say that they're responding to customer demand in saying they want, they want uh, uh, fish of a, of a, of a quality and, 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 and grown, developed, fed, uh, to, to meet certain environmental standards. Lorello, is there anything you can do here? Is the Commission going to be bringing forward ideas on better consumer information, do you think? Well, uh, I would like to mention first uh, the fact that we are uh, working to improve the situation still. I mean, we have uh, adopted in 2013 a strategic guidance, EU level, a strategic guidance for the sector to grow sustainably. And as, as I mentioned, we still think there's a lot of potential to do more in terms of uh, growth, definitely, competitiveness, and also we can improve uh, environmental performance, of course, as any other sector. It's not specific to aquaculture. And this is a demand that will come in the context of the European Green Deal. So uh, we are going to work on a revision of that strategy, and we are doing that. And uh, certainly, uh, well, all these questions that we're discussing here are part of it. And consumer information is certainly one key aspect. Uh, uh, I think uh, if we come to the discussion on uh, on consumer information, we are not only uh, probably talking to, about aquaculture, we are talking about most of food production. Uh, it's, a, it's an issue that is raised uh, about all food production. Why the EU uh, producers have to meet certain standards and uh, then face arguably higher costs while we are importing products that probably are not uh, subject to those to equivalent standards, uh, and this is the situation. Uh, the question is not about protection, like Javier said, it's about informing the consumer, and the consumer takes responsibility as well. And I think there are more and more consumers that are really eager to take responsibility if they are fully informed about uh, what they buy. And I think also the, the COVID-19 situation has led to uh, the consumers also realize that uh, food security is an issue, and that local supply is an issue, it's, it has a value. I think before we didn't realize that because we thought we were we had access to endless uh, stocks of food, and then we realized when there's a clear, a clear disruption in the system, uh, we need local supply. We need uh, we need to ensure uh, supply of, of food. But uh, yeah, I think there's going to be efforts by the Commission, uh, not only in aquaculture but um, more broadly speaking, because this is a broader debate than aquaculture. So uh, and hopefully, we, in the context of uh, the European Green Deal, we will uh, deal with this kind of issue. Yeah, of course, tomorrow I think the Commission is supposed to adopt its new farm to fork strategy. And I've seen a draft and it has sort of a, a little mention of aquaculture here and there, but I can't say it's uh, you know, at the centre. But Chris, on this whole issue of consumer information, I mean, this is all music to your ears, really, isn't it? I mean, you want the, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council wants, wants people to be taking a uh, greater account of, of, of the food they're buying and you know, looking, looking out for your label. But, the, but, but although we can 
you know, praise that. The reality is surely that relatively few consumers are asking these questions and by no means all retailers are insisting upon higher standards. Microphone, Chris. I think you're absolutely right, Chris. I mean, when you look at it in absolute and the big picture, then, you know, not all businesses, not all consumers are actually uh, driving uh, the need for uh, the consumption of more responsible uh, aquaculture. But if you look at if you step back from that and look at what the trends are telling you, then increasingly we're seeing more and more businesses making commitments to responsibly resourcing uh, responsibly. And we're seeing a growing recognition and demand for responsible products in the market. So from a low base uh, 10 years ago, we now have over 15,000 active products with our logo on globally and over 80 percent of that is within the European Union markets. So there is a growing interest in having this uh, demonstration that this product is better than something that isn't. And and I think, it, you know, to the discussion we had about a level playing field, I mean, I think, yes, you want a fantastic policy uh, uh, structure to, to create an enabling environment for the growth of aquaculture, for the protection of, uh, of, of, of rights. Um, but I think there's also a role for a program like the ASC uh, to help with that, with, that, uh, with that objective, because you can clearly um, demonstrate through a direct co communication with the consumer through the logo that this product is, is good, it's better. Um, please buy it. Well, people, I'm going to throw some of these questions to the environmentalists at you in a, in a moment or two. But we're at the halfway point, so let me just remind you that uh, this is a Blue Deal debate. We're talking about aquaculture and uh, farmed fish. And the debate's been made possible thanks to the people at the Wood Pedersen Consultancy in Brussels. I'm sometimes told that when I do this halfway announcement, I sound very American, you know, giving a, a word from our sponsors. But Wood Pedersen is actually not American. It's a Swedish consultancy with a big public affairs team in, in, in Brussels of all nationalities. Um, if you know people who can't be with us, then uh, for this live debate, then understand that you can see a repeat if you're registered by pressing the button on the right hand side uh, later on. And uh, it'll be on YouTube from tomorrow afternoon. You can also submit questions or comments and our team here will be spending some time to consider those uh, on the hour for, for, uh, for 30 minutes or so. Now. Um, if I may, uh, Harvey wants to come in. So, thank over you, to you. Chris. Yeah, just before we shift to another uh, view or another topic, um, when I talk about consumer information, it's not only retailing, it's also restaurants, it's also catering. That's where most consumers are completely disoriented. They have no idea what they are eating. And we have to find solutions also there. And of course, just a final comment on this consumer information. When consumers go and buy fish, they are not only, and let's say after looking at many reports on this, many lots of research, they do not look only for the environmental aspects of the production of that fish, in which certainly ASC plays a, a good role, but they also are looking for freshness, quality, origin, uh, nutritional values, welfare of the animals. So it's uh, it's difficult for consumers, and that's why the Commission is also playing a role in finding marketing standards for fishery product, for fish in general, to find solutions to make it easier for consumers. So it, it, today we are talking about environment, it's fine, that's why I said before, but there are many other aspects in person that consumers are also concerned about. That's right. it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And you've just been hearing, uh, if you're viewing, from uh, Javier Ojeda the Secretary General of the Federation of European Aquaculture Producers. And with us also are Lorella de la Cruz Iglesias from the European Commission, the head of the aquaculture team there, and Chris Ninnis, the Chief Executive of the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. So thank you. Let, let me throw the environmental argue, arguments. And the biggest single one, surely, um, is that in order to, to, to farm fish, you've got to feed them. And so much of the food comes from the wild. In some cases, in some cases, I think, what is it? Five, you need five kilograms of caught fish 
in order to feed a kilogram of commercially sold farmed fish. In some cases is worse than that. I mean, the environmentalists would not surprisingly say this is unsustainable. If we're carrying on farming the fish, we're actually emptying our seas in order to do so. Now, who would like to come back at me? Lorella. I mean, this is, you know, yeah, Javier wants to, but you, you come back. I mean, this, is, this surely is the, surely the big, a major concern for sustainability, an issue you raised. So is it me now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I think uh, I think there is a concern on, on feed, indeed. Uh, but I think in on this we have to also put things in perspective. I think the the feed ratio, like using feed stocks, wild feed stocks for for feed, has decreased significantly already. It still is there, and there are different types of, of course, of, of concerns. One one concern is basically is that uh, fish content and the feed sustainably. Uh, obtained. I mean, is it uh, uh, legal fisheries? And I think on that uh, we 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 are careful. Uh, the other question is uh, whether uh, we can, uh, rather than uh, feeding our fish with another fish, we can you know feed people with the fish we're using for farming fish. Okay. So I think uh, I think if you take into consideration that the fish farm fish as any other fish has certain nutritional requirements and welfare requirements that you have to, to maintain. I mean, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, put in, in risk uh, the health of, of the fish by giving something that is completely, you know, not adequate to the fish. You, there is really a lot of potential to replace uh, the use of fish uh, meal, fish soil in, 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 in feed. And I think the, there's some progress in this, not only in terms of, you know, research, but also in terms of commercialization of feed. And there's a lot of potential, for example, in using algae, in using insects, and I think that's uh, that's the direction this uh, this is taking. Uh, and this and there's so there are just two issues: sustainably uh, sustainably sourced. And I, I'm not talking only about fish. I mean, there's also the question of you know the soya meal you use for for feed. I mean, there's other questions. It's not only fish. Uh, but uh, I think we are making progress. There's research out there. There's uh, companies that are making the effort to replace uh, the, the content of wild fish uh, used in in, uh, in feed. Uh, so I think we're in the right direction. Well, Javier, come on, are we going to make our fish vegetarian? Solve our problems? Uh, we'll get there. Just, just answering to the figures that you presented about five or even more kilos. Okay, that is slightly obsolete figure today, I, I dare say. And uh, today, most uh, pisciverous species like salmon or sea bass or sea bream are net producers of marine protein. That means that more of those fish is produced and taken from the seas. There's been a huge amount of research in this time. Aquaculture has been completely aware of this challenge in the last 50 years. And today we use the same amount, today globally, the same amount of fish is taken from the seas captured to produce fish meal and fish oil today than 50 years ago, and still same quantity, we have five times more farmed fish. So something is happening there. What is happening? We don't have a magic wand. No, we are replacing, we have been replacing the raw materials in the feed of the fish for a long time. No, not only moving away from marine raw materials, but better using marine raw materials, including each time more the uh, trimmings of fish that go for that are captured for human consumption and the trimmings are of no use for human consumption and those go into the feed that, that are converted into fish meal and fish oil. Then of course we have algae, we have krill, we have other sources of marine ingredients that can go that are going into the feeds. But not only that, each time more we are going towards the concept that you have just mentioned about vegetarian fish. Okay, today we're in a webinar. It's it's uh, general communication. Here we are talking about relatively complex issues in which, of course, we, there are lots of details into them. But to explain it plainly, you cannot convert a carnivorous creature into herbivorous. I mean, as human beings, we can stop eating beef and eat vegetables, but that is not possible for for animals. I mean, we do not do that. What we can do is gain through scientific knowledge enough understanding of what 
animal, what our animals need to grow, to develop, to have a good well-being. So we are able today to look for each of the amino acids, each of the fatty acids that the fish, each species bass bream at different stages of their life, what exactly needs, and then go and source that amino acid or that fatty acid or that vitamin wherever it's available. That is not making it uh, a vegetarian, okay. Okay. but it is a way to use feed that come from a lower trophic level in the general ecosystem picture and that is important. Okay Chris, we're Chris Nellis from the Agriculture Stewardship Council. You've heard Javier there saying really we're producing globally, we're producing more farmed fish and yet in practice the amount of wild caught fish being required to, to meet that demand is going down, we're making a lot of progress. Is that is that the case? Can you well, justify that? Yes and no. Yes, at a global level, we've made a lot of progress in the sense that we produce a lot more fish uh, from the marine ingredients uh, um, uh, industry. Um, but at the same time, as uh, Lorella mentioned right from the beginning, the most important thing to view any agriculture or aquaculture that's fed is, is that product source from a sustainable, sustainable source. And if it's not, then we need to do something to promote that. Uh, because clearly that's driving us into a deeper, into a hole that we need to stop digging. Um, so uh, aquaculture has made great strides, but in certain parts of the world uh, where fishing is, uh, where fishing occurs more indiscriminately than it does say within Europe or in uh, uh, part in the North Atlantic, then uh, the, the consequences for those fish that go into aquaculture or into other fed agriculture are catastrophic. And we have to turn our lens further afield because those are meaningful impacts on marine ecosystems that have to be changed because it's because some of those systems may not recover uh, or if they do recover could be in different states from what they should be. So. We have to look at this from a from a big global perspective. Uh, aquaculture has its role to play in it. It's making great strides, but in many parts of the world, it could do a lot better. Just a quick answer. I, I saw a number of people from uh, developing algae as a potential fish farm feedstuff. Uh, I mean, frankly, I, I, I hear a lot of time algae being the solution to the climate problem and to now to fish farm feeding problems. Are we there? Are we going to be there in the next five years? Are we going to be able to fall back on algae as the, as the, as the means of providing I, I think fresh fish protein? There's a lot of potential in, uh, in seaweed production around, around the world for many uses, both, uh, you know, currently, I mean, there's something like 25 million tons of it farmed already that goes into uh, direct consumption, uh, human consumption as, as feed, as an ingredient in many uh, many products as a pharmaceutical chemical source of uh, micronutrients. It's a it's a fantastic uh, uh, production system. It has impacts, of course it does. You can't farm anything at that scale without there being impacts. So you have to be conscious about it. And the potential of seaweed is there, although still unproven, uh, for doing much more even at a at a at a climate scale. So there's there's massive production, but but we're not there yet in terms of that climate solution. We're certainly there in terms of it, for it being a really important uh, ingredient that's used globally. Lorella, um, the other big issue, I said, and of course there's many which we won't be able to touch upon, but when it comes to sustainability and protecting the environment, it's, it's water pollution, isn't it? Um, and, water, and in the European Union, of course, we have the Water Framework Directive which I'm sure some of Harvey's members feel is a, is a huge obstacle to agriculture production. Or maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong. No, Javier says it's like, okay, okay. But how do, we, how do we reconcile our environmental protection with the need to, with the desire to produce more fish from agriculture? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question that you do said. We, do, we, do, we, do, we, do, our, do our environmental laws actually hinder the development of agriculture to the point which is simply unreasonable? 
Well, I would, I would argue that they don't, in fact. I mean, I, I would argue that environmental laws are something that precisely promotes uh, aquaculture in the sense that it gives certain guarantees to consumers that are, uh, you know, uh, in the market uh, looking for sustainable products that, you know, those products that are in the market and produced in the EU are, are indeed sustainable. Of course, uh, any type of uh, regulation, regulation uh, and including environmental protection has certain costs. I mean, that's that's uh, that's understood. But I think uh, there has been support for the industry to adapt to this uh, to these uh, requirements. Uh, I can mention, for example, the European Maritime Sufficient Fund. Uh, they have they have uh, provided support uh, uh, through member states to the industry to to uh, to progress in this in this sense in terms of uh, of meeting environmental requirements and other type of requirements so uh, i think uh, there shouldn't be this shouldn't be a hurdle i think in a way that might be a hurdle in the sense that of course this legislation is applied at eu member state level uh, and there might be different interpretations maybe uh, of what the legislation requires and there's also the question of coordinating uh, different agencies uh, dealing with aquaculture environmental agencies uh, the, the agencies with with licenses so I think I think there shouldn't be a, a problem. Environmental legislation is there precisely to promote uh, EU aquaculture uh, as a sustainable source of food and feed. Uh, but indeed, we have identified that it's still a problem, but not only related to environmental legislation, but in general and administrative procedures uh, related to aquaculture at uh, EU member state level. We had a little poll. Um, conducted uh, and uh, some of our viewers have, have dialed in and the question was uh, is aquaculture the sustainable future for fishing or an environmental disaster and the results of the poll as conducted uh, early on was that 71% thought it was part of our sustainable future and 10% uh, only thought it was an environmental disaster that probably reflects the people who are currently watching a program on aquaculture production because you know, I've seen some quotes from environmental NGOs. I mean, uh, current aquaculture is ecologically unsustainable and a major driver of marine biodiversity loss. And another one, aquaculture as industrialized underwater factory farming is an ecological disaster. I take it, well, Chris, if I, I, can't, I can't really put that question to Javier because of course he's going to say that's not true. <laughs> Chris, are those comments too extreme? Um, You're hesitating. Because, uh, that, suggests, that suggests you well, have a suggest because, agreement with it. Because I think those concerns apply uh, in, in certain parts of the world, for certain companies, uh, certain species and situations. Um, but I think you, you, you have to take I, I can't answer a question like that in the sense that you have to look at this from a from a global perspective. You've got to look at what we're doing to this planet uh, across all of our production systems, and to single out aquaculture when you when it's got many attributes is is difficult. But certainly, uh, and particularly in the past, uh, there's, there's been uh, uh, poorer performance by aquaculture, even within uh, within our relatively uh, uh, close proximity to, to us. Um, but I think uh, in other parts of the world, then I'd say, yes, there are some big impacts that come from, uh, uh, from, from aquaculture without a doubt. And that's what we've got to work to resolve. I mean, like I mentioned before, even for seaweed, which is considered such a benign crop, uh, you know, it doesn't need to be fed, but it, 25 million tons of it takes up a lot of seabed. It covers a lot of seabed it has impacts because it, it it changes the system. So, you know, all of these system, all of these production systems, is a trade-off, and um, nothing's perfect. You know, we we don't breathe without having an impact on the on the environment. So we we've got to manage a way forward that reduces the worst and and and, and supports the best. And uh, okay. a, a challenge we've got to we've got to really run fast to to achieve. Javier, I take it, um, you know, I read out a couple of quotes from environmental NGOs, but I take it you would argue that you know, European aquaculture production just, just does not resemble the picture that is being painted here. Uh, no, 
Uh, however, all opinions are valuable and we have to listen to everybody that has a concern on aquaculture. As has been said here today, there's always room for improvement. But of course, the standards that aquaculture has to comply with in Europe are completely different to many other parts of the world. And when we import 65% of all the seafood that we consume in the European market, that is important, it has to be concerned. And before you, you mentioned the uh, environmental legislation, we aquaculture people welcome environmental protection in Europe. I mean, the Water Framework Directive or the Marine Strategy Framework Directive for us are really what we need. You cannot do fish farming if you do not have good quality water. We need clean waters to do the farming. Of course, take care of that water to leave it that way. Okay, but if just, let me just cut, cut in then, because we're coming, we're coming towards the end. What do you need then in order to promote agriculture? If it's not the environmental legislation that's holding you back, what, what do you need to drive forward agricultural production in, in Europe? Okay, there are issues in environmental protection that have to be considered because I, I'm going to mention four specific issues in which that would help aquaculture in Europe and in the rest of the world. First of all, simplification, simplification of administrative burden, cutting down red tape. This is very important. And the main issue that makes, uh, creates that red tape has to do with environmental legislation. So it's not the directives, it's the implementation of the directives. And it's the implementation by people that know very little about aquaculture. We are talking about civil servants in offices in the regions of Europe or the municipalities okay. of Europe. Right. Okay. I'll, I'll drive you on. That's one. Red tape. Next one. Fully implementation of consumer information mainly in restaurants, catering and retailers. The third one, and we haven't mentioned it here, but it's very important, value, uh, the, the value chain. We need a transparent and fair value chain. Many people complain about the sizes of the... the many people would like small family fish farms or micro enterprises. And that today it's very difficult because the other end of the value chain are huge multinational companies that have a, a dominant position in the market and make it extremely difficult. So the third one, fair value chain. And of course, the last one is to cooperate with third countries that, so that they can raise their production standards. It will be good for them. It will be good for us. That's in a nutshell, four solutions. Okay. Well, Lorella, I know you uh are working on revising the European Commission's guidelines to, to European governments. Um, I think there's proposals you, you hope to bring them out maybe this year. And what are the principles of when, 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 upon which those guidelines are going to be based? Uh, when they're going to be adopted. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I mean, I'm, I'm not expecting you to tell us everything now, but... Um, yeah. You know, you no, can give no, us a general I, idea. No, sorry, it's, it was a question of, of not hearing properly. Uh, so, no, uh, our ambition is to adopt them still this year. Uh, we are going through a process of, uh, you know, comprehensive consultations with experts in member states, with uh, with Aquaculture Advisory Council, where Javier has a key role also, uh, where you have different stakeholders, including uh, industry, but also NGOs. And uh, so uh, we are working on it, but we want to really make a serious effort to have guidelines that everybody can in a way, endorse or, or or agree to, because it doesn't it doesn't help having guidelines from the Commission that nobody is going to implement at the end of the day. So, so we need to do we need to have the buy-in of member states and and stakeholders, because the Commission alone cannot do uh, the work. Um, if I make to come back uh, to the question of of uh, well to the main question of this debate, in fact, uh, alternative to fisheries, uh, environmental disaster. Uh, I don't think uh, we have to talk about aquaculture as, you know, uh, aquaculture versus fisheries. I think fisheries will, will stay. Sustainable fisheries can stay. There's no problem with that. But it's true that if we need to, to increment, to, to, to increase our, uh, our supply of, you know, uh, food production in the EU uh, and uh, meet the demand, uh, we cannot rely only on fisheries. That's, that's true. I mean, we have to, we have, to uh, have uh, fish farming and and not only fish farming, we talk about shellfish, we talk about algae, uh, because here when we have discussed the problems or environmental problems that are uh, perceived by citizens and consumers, 
we prefer to feed, but there's a lot of aquaculture that is not fed. I mean, uh, mollusks kind of fed. Uh, so oysters, mussels, uh, this is not uh, something that has to be felt, fed. And there are other things like algae, for example, that don't need, uh, don't need feed. So we work on, on two things. We would like to have a feed that is more sustainable on the one hand, but also we'd like to diversify the production in the EU to something that doesn't need so much feed. Uh, so um, I think that uh, aquaculture is a very diversified sector. We cannot draw conclusions on, or, or in general, that apply to all the different you know, realities of, of aquaculture. There's a question I should have put to you, um, perhaps to Javier, but perhaps the others too. If we were to see a big increase in aquaculture production in Europe, what fish would we be eating? I mean, in China, it's mainly carp, and carp is uh, you know, carp is not a, a fish eaten in huge quantities, I think, in the European Union. Well, uh, carp is good fish. I mean, in Hungary, in Czech Republic, in Croatia, in Germany, we eat really carp. Not as, not as much carp as in Asia, obviously, because it's the biggest species of aquaculture fish is carp in Asia. But, but in some parts of Europe, it's very important and it's good. Um, what fish will we eat? Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, there are always, I mean, Lorella has mentioned aquaculture is very diversified already. Nevertheless, there are efforts to diversify further in species and also in products, in both. In both. And there are many species. Fish are the most abundant, had the more number of species in the, in the vertebrate world globally than uh, any other animal group. So there's a lot to choose from. Uh, but what is important, the key underlying elements that have always to be to be respected are this responsible production, this sustainability, whatever the species, it doesn't matter, it's not a matter of change the, change the species. What is important is to keep good principles on what we have to do. So Chris, is the Aquaculture Stewardship Council um, certifying any interesting species of fish at the moment or unusual species? Uh, I think we certify the main uh, internationally traded species, that's for sure. Uh, so salmon and sea bass, sea breams, trout, uh, Seriolas, cobias, you know, the, the likes there, uh, bivalves uh, and seaweed. Um, but we are looking to develop uh, a, a, a carp standard. Um, we are looking to expand the numbers of crustaceans that we uh, that we um, that we could we can certify. But I think, uh, you know, if you look at to your question about what will we be eating in the future? Well, I think you need to look at what we eat in the past as well. And uh, and I think you'll see a continuation of uh, uh, an appetite for salmon and trout and sea bass and sea bream. I think those species will play a big role in future supply. Uh, but carp is eaten in uh, in Europe, and it's uh, uh, and uh, I could well see that uh, expanding its uh, 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 production as well. So I think there's a great opportunity for European agriculture if, if it, it can become unlocked. Um, and build on that provenance story um, and, uh, and and get product into the marketplace. Because yeah, and have, the, ha, ha, Javier mentioned at the very beginning the, the extent of the European coastline, but actually in, in, I think in China now, more fish is actually grown inland than in the marine environment around the coasts. That's the case, oh, I mean, do, yeah. That, that's, that's, a, that's a general... Uh, a, a general, a general fact. I mean, and has been for for many, many, many years. That you know, the freshwater species and the coastal habitats have been the the main uh, production areas for aquaculture. I mean, 20 million tons of carp uh, are produced all out of uh, all out of freshwater. So it's. Uh, uh, and this is it, is this, is this in tanks or is it in lagoons or you know is it uh, uh, is it possible is it possible to use the natural environment? Less, Fl less, flooded, flooded, flooded areas, for example, for fish farming. Less, less tanks and more ponds, um, some flooded areas. And in fact, there's many uh, innovative production systems involved with uh, uh, in, in around rice production, for instance. Um, the whole crayfish industry in China um, in excess of a million tons of product. A lot of it uh, farmed in conjunction with rice, uh, rice paddies, which are seasonal and flooded. So. Um, there's a lot of innovation in this sector, and uh, uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's an exciting. It is a, it is exciting. Okay, thank you very much um, for for the moment. Um, now, um, as we come to the end of this this first section, the, the the debate proper, I usually like to give some indication of what's coming up. Uh, I'm in the hands of the European Commission because we hope that tomorrow the Commission will adopt its biodiversity strategy, 
which will have major implications for the for the fishing industry. And therefore, I'm, I'm very much hoping that we'll be able to uh, have a special webinar next week with the Director General of DG Murray from the from, from the European Commission to talk about the, the strategy and to debate with perhaps potential critics. Now, um, before that, though, uh, and as we don't know yet whether or not it will be adopted, I can't make an announcement about next week's uh, next week's uh, session. I just want to say thank you very much to uh, for the present to those who have been with us today. That's Chris Nillis from the Agriculture Stewardship Council, Javier Ojeda from the European Federation, the Federation of European Agriculture Producers, and Norella de la Cruz uh, Iglesias from the European Commission. Now, uh, all of you I know are staying on, so you don't need to turn off because we've got some questions that have been uh, emailed in, and we're going to discuss those on a sort of more informal basis. If anyone wants to go make themselves a cup of coffee now, that's the time to do it. Um, I hope we've got another 20, 25 minutes in which to uh, ponder this subject. Now, if you know of anyone uh, who'd like to see this webinar, haven't had a chance to, to tune in now, uh, it's possible to find it through the registration button on the right-hand side of your screen, or it'll be on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, it has been brought uh, thanks to the organizational team at Rood Pedersen, the consultancy in Brussels, who are allowing my brain to continue to work doing lockdown and Brexit and, and all that nonsense. Um, and um, I just want to um, point out that we've had an interesting debate over the past hour between an industry spokesman, a policymaker, and um, I don't think the Agriculture Stewards Council is an NGO, but, but, but uh, something of that kind, an environment, a, a body committed to sustainability. And it's interesting how close the views are. And I, I must say, during these debates, I found so often that there is a coming together of the different parties uh, with a lot of consensual thinking about the way forward. Really think we should be exploring that and seeing how we can set up forums to facilitate that in the future. So that's it for the debate proper. Now we're going to go over to the questions and uh, I'm going to fire the first one at you that I've seen has been emailed in. And it's um, from the, um, the head of maritime services at uh, DTU Aqua Danish Centre for Marine Research. Um, husbandry. We recognise that husband, husbandry needs subsidies to exist. So why not aquaculture? Do we need subsidies for aquaculture? Well, I suppose, I mean, the EMFF, uh, Lorella, has got about, uh, there's a lot of money, there's 6 billion euros in the EMFF, that's the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, for the next few years. And there's quite an allocation of that for aquaculture within it, isn't it? And what's that, what can that money be used for? Well, if actually from those uh, 6 billion uh, euros, it's only 1.2 billion euros for, for aquaculture in the, well, only, I mean, it's quite a lot, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the current uh, fund. Uh, and uh, indeed, this is, is quite a substantive support to, to the sector. Uh, this is a support that goes, that is administered through member states. So it's, it's, it's a fund that is available, but then it's member states that have to decide where to put the money and uh, you know to commit the money and to, and to spend it so uh, and each member state has different different priorities uh, for the sector so um, just to mention something that we haven't mentioned before is, is the fact that each uh, member state has a, a national strategy to develop the sector so the funding has to relate to that uh, and indeed there is support to the sector there is support for for uh, for growing uh, for a growing a more sustainable way uh, and uh, for innovation in the sector for uh, communication, uh, for uh, organization of the sector, uh, for the establishment of producer organizations. So there is there is a support there. There might be a question about how effective uh, is the delivery of that support. Uh, and that also very much depends on the procedures to, to, to bring this support to the, to the individual companies. But indeed, this, uh, this, this is a significant support to the sector. In recognition of so the important role, yeah. Have, you, have your members got their hands out looking for some European cash? Okay, let's, if we leave aside the COVID-19 crisis, that is a very specific uh, tsunami that has swept everything. As a sector, aquaculture in Europe would prefer not to have absolutely any public aid. Hmm? What we would need is solve the administrative hurdles, reduce the red tape, implementation of consumer information, 
transaction, transparency of the value chain, and a good level playing field with what comes with the imports. That is where we want the solution. In the meantime, as we don't get good solutions for that, of course, subvention of public aid for the promotion, for innovation, for uh, fish health, for better environmental practices, they are welcome. But of course, the ideal situation is in a, in a free market, in an open market, each, each company each sector has to stand by itself. Unfortunately, we are not in this uh, fair market right now. And that's why the EMFF exists, like the Common Agriculture Policy. But it's not the target. That's, that it is not the target of the industry. Okay, a question here from um, Anton Imink, the Aquaculture Director of the Sustainable Fisheries Partnership. So asking about retailers, really. I mean, you know, Javier was talking about a uh, level playing field um, with imported products, but the retailers are the ones who, who, who make the big difference here. They're the ones who provide the information and they both respond and, and uh, influence consumer patterns. Shouldn't the retailers be doing more, you know, going, go, going out to, the, to, if you like, to, to, uh, to the markets where, 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 where uh, aquaculture is at its strongest in the Asian market and insisting that they meet the same sort of standards that we have to do in Europe. I mean, Chris, you work for the retailers here. Um, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I suppose I come back here partly to the fact that there was a few retailers who stand out as, as, as and similarly with fish processing companies, a standout that wanted to put these principles of sustainability to, to the fore. And there's an awful lot of retailers that just don't bother. It's, I think it's a, you've got to look at it with a timeline and a perspective. I think if you look back 10 years ago, then uh, the, the state of play then was much worse than it is now. It's improved a great deal. Is there more to do? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot more to do to promote uh, 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 more businesses to want to source responsibly uh, globally. Uh, and there's a, there's a role to play in, in promoting and fostering uh, consumer interest in, in this in this story and, and providing them with the information that they need uh, to, to promote better practices. So I, I think, as you said, a lot of businesses are doing a good job, um, but but more could still be doing better. So there's, we're on a journey. We, it won't, we won't solve it overnight. Um, it takes a market to, to drive this, generate that. It takes businesses to innovate within it to seize the opportunity. And I think we're on that journey. Uh, we just need to keep the fire going. Yeah, so I suppose, if we, and, and it's up to all of us, isn't it, as consumers. If we want the retailers yeah. to be taken to be doing something, we have to urge the retailers to, to do so. Well, retail and food service. I mean, it's uh, we mustn't forget the role of food service in the supply of fish and, and an opportunity for a good conversation with a consumer. Because if you're sitting down or you're in a restaurant setting or, uh, you know, it's not that hectic. Um, selecting products in, into your shopping basket. I mean, it's uh, time to have uh, a, a good conversation with those people buying uh, responsibly sourced fish. Yeah. Okay, here's, here's a, please, Lorella. No, I think I think something I would add to this is uh, indeed the retailers have a role to play and the food service sector has a role to play. I mean, just giving some very general examples. Even it's something that doesn't necessarily show in in surveys. I mean. If you try to go to a restaurant uh, in Brussels or elsewhere and you ask, uh, you know, when you yourself see by see whether it's wild caught or, or farm, you will see often a reaction, you know, like if it's farm, they almost want to apologize. I mean, and this is not normal. I mean, this is, they have to inform people that the quality is there for farm production, that there is no, uh, no uh, significant difference in terms of nutritional value and that they shouldn't be afraid of, of farm food. I mean, it's, it's something that is positive. And, uh, and wild cat, catch has a role to play and also farm food. So I think this is something that still, in terms of perception of the sector and of the production, there's still work to, to be done. Well, I remember having being taken out on a boat to see a sea bream farm off the Canary Islands and then eating the sea bream later on and it was superb. Um, I'll probably simply saying that I'll probably get in trouble with some environmentalists and indeed um, we have a question here from uh, Bruno Campos, the uh, Senior Marine Policy Officer at BirdLife Europe, um, which and she's asking why can the EU not impose a sustainability criteria to products that are imported? So I mean this is this is the level playing field really isn't it? 
sustainability criteria? Is that an instrument that the European Commission could consider uh, proposing? Well, I think uh, I, we can say that there, is, uh, there are certain sustainability criteria already for imported products in terms of uh, protection of the consumer. I mean, there's sanitary uh, requirements for imports in the EU. So that's, uh, that's something that happens already. Uh, of course, in terms of uh, environmental protection, maybe animal welfare, we are not imposing our legislation to other third countries that are trying to export to the EU. Uh, we cannot do as such because we have international trade commitments that don't allow us to just impose our own legislation on other countries. But of course, uh, more can be done in, 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 the, in the sense of, you know, uh, communication and promoting better practices from other member states that are exporting to the European Union. Etc. This is a this is a complex matter because uh, sustainability doesn't have a single uh, definition. I mean, uh, uh, there are many many different uh, angles to sustainability. Is uh, you know, like we said, uh, you know, pollution, but also energy use and uh, you know, uh, different different aspects. So it's a complex uh, thing to to uh, to settle as international agreed standard. And we are making progress in, in the sense that we are discussing in international fora like the FAO uh, in order to uh, support the rising of the standards uh, more globally speaking, supporting other countries to, to improve their standards, uh, etc. But uh, indeed, this is a question that is, is on the table. Uh, how can we ensure that uh, there is more sustainable food in the European market? Yeah, I mean, this sustainability criteria, how it might differ. Chris, you have this. You must have this difficulty, for example, in, in, in water quality. I, I was just hearing last night that there's clearly a difference in the, you know, in the standard of water you'll get off the coast of Chile from a, a PT Scottish sea lock. And, you know, maybe that, maybe your, your criteria have to reflect the, the natural differences. To, to a certain extent, because uh, the local circumstances uh, dictate what that baseline is. I, I'm not talking here about environmental pollution, but by, you know, the, the systems just differ. So you, there needs to be some recognition of that within within the standard. But, but you know, many of the things we're talking about here uh, is a role that certification can play um, in the sense that it does give uh, to, a, to a common set of rules, if you like, uh, a level of performance and uh, that can then be translated into the marketplace. So I, I think there's a, a role for uh, um, uh, certification programs like the, uh, the ASC in, in this discussion and, it, and in this solution, because it provides that uniformity uh, that consumers can, uh, can look to. And on the allocation of money, Lorella, uh, or indeed uh, Javier, the, you know, from the fisheries funds, the uh, Maritime and Fisheries Fund, are there any and criteria? I mean, do do do, um, for example, fish farm producers do they have to do they have to demonstrate sustainability criteria and meeting all the environmental standards before they get any money from the EU? Certainly, yes. You, if you're a fish farm, you could you you cannot operate in the European Union unless you are sustainable. No, next day they close you down. Mm -hmm. The standards, the regulations, the directives on environmental protection in the European Union are uh, very high. That's good. If you don't comply with them, you're closed. Of course, we have a, an issue that there is no clear definition on sustainability. Furthermore, it might, might even be impossible uh, to define. You can define responsible, I mean, criteria for performing something in a responsible way. That is what AAC is done, but you cannot establish a, a stamp sustainability or sustainability stamp because actually sustainability has to do with the environmental pillar social pillar economic pillar and you have to take all three into consideration only one and you fall over so it's uh, it, it's not easy it's not tricky but certainly the european union has a very high standards on almost everything and we set standards for all over the world and that's good unless you know, if we just we were just talking about fish, you know, we talked earlier. We were talking about the feeding of um, wild caught fish to to um, farmed fish, and we were talking about potential developments and you know more vegetarian elements within perhaps the, the, the diet. But there's no requirement upon that, is there? I mean, I've got a question here from um, from Ian Carr at uh, Veramis. Veramis, my pronunciation is probably wrong. 
where he's pointing out that the use of novel raw materials, which might be more sustainable, at the moment is entirely optional in, in fish food. I mean, should we be introducing some criteria in order to accelerate the development of uh, alternatives to wild caught fish? Like algae, for example. Yeah. Um... I mean, of course, I mean, you cannot put anything into a fish meal, into a fish food and just give it to the fish. You have to comply with the regulations. You have to comply with all the European rules on what is fed to animals that are going to be eaten by, by consumers. And of course, there you do not have sustainability criteria per se like that, but you have many, many different aspects of which you can only fulfill if you do it in a responsible way. But should we, I mean, Lorella maybe, I mean, should we be introducing, you know, something to 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 to, to, to publicize the, the the type of food that's being given to the oh, farm fish to, to, to encourage new technology to new, new, you know to, to give an incentive to uh, to innovation well i think i think we're already giving incentive to innovation i think uh, you know that we have we have talked about the european uh, maritime and fisheries fund but i mean there are other funds that are supporting innovation uh, in aquaculture we have the horizon 2020 fund research and innovation fund and there have been quite a lot of projects on 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 aquaculture including on feed so some of the progress that has been made on feed is also partly thanks to the research that has been done and partly part of the research has been done uh, with eu funds so we are promoting alternatives to uh, uh, for in terms of more sustainable sources of, of feed, that's, uh, that's happening. I think the consumer is uh, more aware of this issue. I think the role of NGOs is a positive role in this in this respect, that they are really raising, for example, the issue of uh, the use of unsustainable uh, wild-caught fish uh, in, in, in feed in some, in some countries. Uh, I think the consumer is becoming more aware as well. So. Uh, the, 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 the companies can, of course, uh, give the information of the feed they use, and there's things there. Some of them that are making this kind of uh, giving this kind of information that they are using, for example, algae. I think in the in the salmon uh, section is happening already. So uh, I think this uh, is innovation is being promoted, and not only innovation. We're trying to bring the innovation to the market, and uh, and then the consumers play a role. Uh, consumer awareness plays a role. Uh, I would also agree with uh, with Javier that this, this is not only about you know replacing fish uh, products. It's about replacing white caught fish like uh, whole fish in the use in feed. Uh, and there's other things like, like that have been uh, mentioned by Javier, like uh, trimmings, uh, waste from fish can also be used, uh, and uh, and innovation in that respect can be promoted uh, in using this kind of you know byproducts of fish, white caught fish in in feed. So certainly from the Commission point of view, we want to promote uh, this alternative uh, uh, feed ingredients and we're doing so with support to, to research and, and so we uh, and innovation. I've got a question here from um, Husam Hamza at the, uh, the Agriculture Office uh, at the uh, um, FAO, the Agriculture Organization, um, just um, asking about the role of farmers, um, farmers organizations and the extent to which agriculture developments and farmers, I mean, it, it often strikes me that uh, there's a lot of farmers who've got a lot of space and, and often water supplies, um, and that diversification into agriculture in some cases would make a lot of sense. Um, I just, perhaps, uh, perhaps Javier, I mean, do you talk with your colleagues in the, in the, in the, in the agricultural sector? Yeah, um, yeah, we do, we do. Um... But I think that the, the, the issue that uh, Hussam Hansa is pointing out has to do with the role of farmers associations. At the European Union, we call them producer organizations and they have a status like interbranch organizations. And what we have been seeing all over Europe and all the Mediterranean, North in Africa countries with which through GFCM of FAO, we have a lot of relation, is the crucial role of farmers associations because farmers are really overwhelmed in the day-to-day -day work with the paperwork, with growing the fish, with doing their work in the best possible way. So they need an association around them that will do all this job. I mean, just like I'm doing here today, it would be very difficult for a farmer that has his fish at home to, farm, to be here. I can do it because I work for an association, federation in this case. And the link between farmers associations, between countries, between continents, on the other side of the world is really a key element 
for the uh, development of the sector. And we've seen that many, many occasions, I know the European Commission is very well aware, well aware of, of this, and that's why in the EMFF and the Common Market Organization, producers' organization are particularly taken care of. Because when you have to do promotion, communication, innovation, and many other aspects, it's farmers' organizations, POs, or name them, you name them, key elements. And they're and a key element globally. If you look at um, many, many production systems overseas uh, in Asia, then they're, they're driven by small scale uh, producers. And the, uh, the route to, to bringing about improvements are through those, through some sort of organization that can, that can coalesce that, uh, that production into, into, into sort of management scale and, and, uh, and to transfer the information that's needed. So uh, globally, uh, uh, farmer producer type organizations, cooperatives, associations are, are vital. Right, I have, a, I have a question here which I don't understand. So um, it's from uh, Joanna Lyons, the senior research fellow at the National University of Singapore. And uh, your views are sought on free floating autonomous roaming robotic cages as a smart new solution towards sustainable agriculture. So there we are, um, free floating autonomous roaming robotic cages. Who starts? <laughs> <laughs> may, may, may I? May yes, I? Yes, sorry. Before going out of planet Earth to populate other planets of the world, to look for space where to live out there, we have to go into the oceans with things like what uh, Joanna Lyons has mentioned. The oceans are huge spaces in which we can do so many things, but no, we have to go not only to the moon, but to Mars and create cities up there. No, in the middle of the seas, there's lots of space that can be used. And once you are there, you will probably obtain most of your food, vegetable, everything from the waters. So there's, it's, it sounds strange, but what she has proposed, it's really, offshore oceanic aquaculture and it has a huge future and, and i don't think it's that far away either because there are sort of many examples of uh, offshore uh, 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 farming that that occurs now at s small scale admittedly uh, but these are pioneers um, and in some ways they're they've been driven offshore by the the, the regulatory hurdles they have of, of establishing the production in in coastal waters so it's a, it's a natural progression of seeking an opportunity in, uh, in waters where, where, they, where they are able to operate. So I, I, I see, I mean, it's, it will happen. This innovation will continue to develop. Yeah. I, I don't quite understand this. Is this free, when do we say free floating? I mean, presumably they're, I mean, they're, they're floating cages, maybe, but, they're, but that's normal. They're, they're, they're still in one particular location. They're not... But they're not anchored. Well, so they, around they, the they move with they move with move with currents. Yeah, when 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 that moment arrives, I'm sure we will have many brands like cars today, and you can choose if it's free floating or moored. <laughs> but the concept the concept is moving into the middle of the oceans or the seas. That's the interesting one. This becomes, actually, maritime, <laughs> this becomes a maritime hazard, isn't it? Um, no, no. Well. I don't know the technical <laughs> name for that, but uh, you, you get yeah. a spot. Mm. I, would, I would say it's a still a kind of pioneer uh, type of uh, type of project. I mean, it's happening, and in Norway they are, you know, already working with some uh, big platforms at uh, at sea, offshore platforms uh, for salmon farming. Of course, uh, there's also some some things that we still have to to improve uh, in terms of. I mean, the, the weather context in offshore is is much harsher, the harder. So. There's innovation still to be done and to make it uh, more profitable. It could be it could be as a solution in, the, in terms of a space for aquaculture. Indeed, but I mean we have to look at the the overall picture of uh, you know how much uh, these demands in terms of robotics and uh, yeah, and uh, and there's also questions of animal welfare and but I think it, it it might be the future, but we have to look at it into a better. I mean we have to do, dig it into it uh, further. Okay, well, it's a new one on me, so that's, I'll, I'll look out for it now. Um, right, well, just two sort of final questions to, to, to finish off. One's, uh, 
One's about why why does the why is the European Union so keen to diversify? Why isn't it just building on on the success of salmon and trout and and, and, and such like? I think Chris probably touched upon that early on, saying you know most effort is going into the existing popular commercial fish, but you may have a comment. And and, and I'll add to that. Um, well, yes, uh, is there a Europe's environmental legislations obviously impose costs upon European producers. Uh, is there a room for a market advantage, um, i.e. a price premium for environmentally responsible practices? I suppose Chris Ninnis from the Aquaculture Stewardship Council would say, well, that's what we're about, isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, I mean, absolutely, we want to, we, we want to push sales Some... towards responsibility, but... Uh, uh, to guarantee a, a, a premium is uh, is not a position that that we that we can su not not support. It's not a position that we act, uh, that we promote in the sense that it's up to up to market supply and demand uh, logistics. Um, but uh, but certainly encouraging uh, and uh, seeking uh, uh, support for uh, the consumption of responsible fish is ab absolutely core to our message. Okay. Yes, Lorella. Yes, I would like to, to also remind that there's a, there's a system also to to uh, in a European system apart from certification, bio certification, we have organic legislation. So basically, if you want to make further efforts to improve your environmental performance, uh, and you you comply with this kind of legislation, the organic farming legislation, uh, you can have also a price premium. And I think it happens. It happens. Organic production still has to be developed further. I think it has, been quite, uh, has uh, grown quite a lot, but in aquaculture, I think there's a lot of potential to grow even uh, uh, more uh, organic production. Okay, and Javi? Answering to your two quick questions quickly. Diversification, certainly very important, very interesting, but will not solve the four issues that are holding aquaculture back. Red tape, uh, consumer information, fair value chain and level playing field. If it would achieve that, great. In the meantime, new spaces will arrive, but we'll all crash against the same wall. And regarding environmental premium, yes, certainly. It will, it's very interesting, but will only work if consumers know what they are buying, why that price is that price. Okay. Well, I think we should um, come to an end there. Oh, I've just had a little note saying that we do expect to have a special webinar um, a special Blue Deal debate webinar next Tuesday, uh, at which you know we hope to look at the Commission's biodiversity strategy uh, in, in in some detail. So um, we'll promote that, of course, in the in the, in the usual way. Um, interesting debate. I hope both those uh, 60, 70 people who are still watching for this question session are, are uh, have enjoyed it. Um, I think you've all heard uh, our participants emphasise not only the the need for the development of aquaculture. Uh, and to remove some of the hurdles in the way, but also you know, emphasising that it's going to go hand in hand with the environmental safeguards, which cause concern to most people. I think that could not have been emphasised more strongly. So I want to just say thank you once again to Lorella, Lorella de la Cruz Iglesias from the European Commission, to Chris Ninnis of the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, and to Javier Bajeda from the Federation of European Aquaculture Producers. I think that's right. Fiat yeah, Penrith. Yeah. <laughs> the Federation of Agriculture Producers of Europe. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, for those of you still watching, I hope you'll watch again this time next week. All the best to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye.